Story 1. Two years ago, I was working an early morning opening shift at a popular hardware retail store. I'm 6'3.5", biracial Hispanic with brown skin, and on the autism spectrum, I've encountered my share of rude customers, but I usually try to stay professional. Customer service requires us to handle entitlement gracefully, which, as you can imagine, isn't always easy. To give you some background, my grandmother on my mother's side had passed away the week before, and my mother had flown to Texas to attend the funeral. My opening shift was on a Saturday the same day my father, sister, and I planned to pick my mother up from the airport in Portland. I took a 6 m to 3 p.m. shift so I could work, go to church, and then drive to the airport. I woke up at 5 m and started my shift, already feeling dead tired. I've done early shifts before, but this one was tougher than usual. Around 9 m, a man, who seemed to be just a few years older than me, came in with his two young children, a boy and a girl. He appeared to be Hispanic like me, but he had a noticeably bloated face, as though there were lumps on it. For simplicity, I'll refer to him as Mr. Bloat. He asked for my help, and since assisting customers is part of my job as a lot associate, I told him yes and got ready to help. He began explaining his project to the cashier I was standing next to. As he went on, I stood there waiting for him to finish so I'd know how to assist him. I was struggling to stay awake and doing my best not to fall asleep right on the spot. Mr. Bloat noticed and asked if I was okay. I assured him I was fine, and he then decided he didn't need my help after all. For the record, I wasn't even looking at his daughter. Thinking that was the end of it, I returned outside to the parking lot, collected two H-shaped lumber carts, and brought them back inside, parking them in the middle of the lumber aisle. That's when I saw Mr. Bloat again, pushing a lumber cart with his daughter riding inside something that isn't exactly safe. Out of nowhere, Mr. Bloat turned to me and said, Forget you, weirdo. That hit a nerve. I hadn't done anything to provoke him, yet here he was insulting me. Normally, we're supposed to ignore these types of remarks from difficult customers to avoid escalating the situation. But this time, I couldn't just let it slide. I went over to him and asked, Excuse me, what was that for? Mr. Bloat then accused me of looking at his daughter inappropriately, implying something terrible. I was taken aback and immediately said, What? No, I wasn't doing that. I hadn't even looked at her in any inappropriate way, and I'm certainly not that kind of person. While I understand that a father will go to great lengths to protect his children, that doesn't give anyone the right to make baseless accusations against an employee who hasn't done anything wrong. I tried to reason with him, but Mr. Bloat kept threatening to involve the manager. For a moment, I wanted to call the manager myself just to let him embarrass himself. However, I was also scared and didn't want to risk my job over something so petty. At that moment, a co-worker, whom I'll call Hermana to protect her privacy, came by and asked what was going on. Hermana is a good friend at work, almost like an older sister to me. She's also Hispanic, but has fairer skin and speaks fluent Spanish, whereas my Spanish skills are average. In front of Mr. Bloat, I told Hermana, This guy said forget you, weirdo to me, and accused me of looking at his daughter. Hermana immediately went into what I can only describe as angry Latina mode and began telling off Mr. Bloat for his behavior pointing out that he didn't know about my autism. I left to cool off in the break room, knowing I'd have to explain everything to my manager eventually. Here's what happened afterward. Mr. Bloat was informed about my autism, and I reported his comments to my boss. Fortunately, I didn't get into any trouble. Mr. Bloat eventually realized he was in the wrong and was forced to apologize, though he never apologized to me directly. I saw him again with his kids while I was outside, but he avoided eye contact and didn't acknowledge his mistake, much less apologize to me personally. Typical entitled parent behavior, right? It didn't matter to me at that point, I was just relieved to put the incident behind me. Since then, I haven't seen Mr. Bloat at the store, but he certainly left a lasting impression. By the way, I still work at the hardware store and I think that encounter remains one of the few times I've dealt with such an entitled customer. Story 2 
Here's an old one from around nine years ago. As past readers know, my older brother is the type of person who lets the tiniest bit of power go to his head. So if he wanted things his way, he'd try like hell to make it happen. My dad even now with a bad knee and bad back. He's a camping enthusiast. It also was always his way of taking a vacation without spending a lot of money. Back then he insisted we all camp together in summer once a year. Back then we never had anything fancy to go camping like trailers or RVS, just tents. That year that I finally decided to buy a bigger tent because I'd been using a small-ish one until then. Before having my own tent, I was forced to share one with my brother. Those days really sucked. If there's one thing I'd always disliked about tent camping back then, it's that I was never comfortable when trying to sleep. Either sleeping on the ground, sleeping on an air mattress, or on foam padding. It was never comfortable. Some people act like air mattresses are comfortable, but they really aren't. When fully inflated, they feel hard. And when underinflated, the air moves around too much depending on how you lay on it. And most air mattresses I've used sprung leaks and were always going flat by morning. So that year I decided to look into something better. A friend of mine showed me this cot he'd recently bought. It was a brand called Timber Ridge, and it was pretty damn comfortable, almost like a real bed. So I decided I was going to find one of these for myself, and I did. Got one used for $100 or so on Marketplace, and I got a nice size tent to go with it from the same seller. I still have that cot too. Back then I was driving my old Camry wagon. I do miss that car from time to time, but having my Tundra is just better. No one really expected me to show up with a better tent and a cot. My dad applauded my new stuff, but my brother was his usual self about it and said cots were nothing special. Then he mocked me for buying the cot and tent used, but that night I slept like a log. My brother slept on an air mattress like usual, and I guess thought I'd have a terrible night, because I usually didn't sleep well when camping back then, but I woke up that morning feeling good, and I did brag about how good the cot and more spacious tent were. That made my brother fume. Later I caught him taking a nap on my cot after I'd put it out to lay in the sun, and just got angry that I'd woken him up. He loved the cot though, and was very upset I made him get off of it. We have a family policy. If it's 100% yours and you bring it, you get to use it when you want it. Later my brother gave me that age old, I've been thinking line. He tried to pull older brother seniority and said he'd be using my tent and cot for the rest of the camping trip. I told him no in an instant, but he tried to dismiss me. We were about to get in a fight about it when our parents intervened. My brother lied and said I told him he could use my tent and cot. But no one believed him because that's how he always was. Dad even played it off as him being a bad joker, which made him fume. Then he just stormed back to his own tent like a kid. Later that evening after a hike, I discovered he'd actually taken my cot from my tent and put it in his own. We had an argument and Dad made him return the cot to my tent, and my brother sulked the whole time he was doing it. Later on at dinner, he had a tantrum over how the air mattress sucked compared to my cot, and I chimed in about that being the reason why I bought it in the first place. We spent the rest of the camping trip with my brother glaring daggers at me. I half expected him to do something like take a knife and cut holes in my tent, but he and I both knew that Dad would make him pay for anything of mine he broke, and then I'd just replace them with the same kind of stuff. He ended up having a miserable time sleeping on his air mattress, because in his own words, once he'd slept on the cot, the air mattress was just no good to him anymore. And when it was time to leave, he said next time he was getting a better tent and cot than mine. I just waved and told him good luck with that, which prompted him to tell me to go screw myself. Dad actually smacked him upside the head for that. I still chuckle remembering it. I knew he'd likely follow through with getting better stuff back then, and he did. But I'm glad I got a stick it to him that time. Later in the summer my dad insisted on another family trip. That's when my brother showed up with a new cot and tent, and bragged about how he'd bought them new, unlike me. But he spent three or four times what I did on my tent and cot. The cots were the same brand too. But while mine was green, his had grass camo printed on the fabric. 
He was really irked when I just kept ignoring his bragging too. Once he realized I just didn't care, things moved on to be more or less normal. But he still went out of his way to get on my nerves. Of course, when I bought a truck, and then later camper trailer, that opened up a whole new can of worms. My brother always had to make everything a pissing contest. He's only recently been getting better about not doing that, as my older post may show the reasons why. Edit, I've noticed my post has a lot of people curious about cots and what good ones there are. Well, here's my take on them. First thing is make sure you get a cot with a decent weight limit. Mine can hold over 350 pounds. You don't want a cot that uses metal springs for tension. Those springs will bend and wear out easily, and cots that use them generally have a weight limit of around 200 pounds. They are also generally flat and not very comfortable, and the springs are noisy. My Timber Ridge cot uses bungees instead of springs, and instead of just being flat, it cradles me a bit, so it's pretty comfortable to sleep on, and I'd still be using it if I didn't have my camper trailer now. The cot is currently in storage at my parents' house. My dad used to be a tent camper, but my parents use a pop-up camper now so he can sleep in a better bed due to his bad back. Secondly, what makes a good cot is padding. Yes, there are super lightweight cots that fold out of a small carry-on, but they aren't very comfortable and are way too complex and easy to break. Take it from the camping enthusiast, though I'm more of a glamper now. Anyway, my Timber Ridge cot has good padding on it, and using it in conjunction with a sleeping bag is great. However, if you're using blankets or just sleeping on it, as is, a cot is great with the summer heat, because since you aren't sleeping on a mattress, cool air collects under the cot and cools your back. Not great in the winter, so use a sleeping bag then, but great in the summer. Cots with good padding will keep you comfortable. Cots like mine are easy to find for sale online. You can order one, or you can get online to whatever site you use to buy used things off other people and see if someone is selling one locally. You can get a good cot like that a lot cheaper depending on the seller. Story 3 This story is set 19 years ago. I remember the exact time because I was working at this place when the September 11th attacks happened. This place was the office of an interior designer in the big city where I lived. I'd been looking for a technology-related job, and an acquaintance had recently been hired as the office manager, so she brought me on board. I was happy to land a job providing technology support, earning a decent hourly wage with flexible hours. Little did I know how strange this place would turn out to be. How strange, you ask? Well, my acquaintance, the new office manager, was almost never in the office. The designer, let's call him Boss, was also rarely there. A little about Boss, he was an older man, easily in his 60s, which seemed ancient to my 22-year-old self. He constantly clenched his jaw and ground his teeth, always seemed distracted, and generally gave off an odd vibe. So, I started this new job and pretty quickly found myself alone in a nice, spacious office, with no onboarding, no training, and nothing to do. I would literally come to work, browse the internet for hours, and then go home or head to class. Every now and then, boss would show up randomly, asking me to handle something vaguely technology-related, like creating a spreadsheet for client names. Then he'd ask me to show him how to do it himself. I'd show him, he'd be thrilled, and then give me a bonus on the spot. Seemed great, right? Right until boss started showing up and losing his temper over the most random things. For instance, he'd get upset that the green ink on his printed Excel spreadsheet wasn't the right shade, or he'd complain that the office manager had called in and wonder why on earth she needed the day off. Many of his complaints had nothing to do with me, and some weren't even within my control. He was becoming increasingly irritated with me whenever he was in the office, which was happening more frequently. I later learned from the office manager that Boss had been cleared by his psychiatrist to start working more hours. Wait, what? It turned out that Boss had been absent a lot when I started because he'd had a mental breakdown and had been advised to reduce his hours. So, his constant distraction, medication side effects, the teeth grinding, a stress reaction he couldn't control, 
Apparently, he even did it in his sleep. It was so severe that his dentist was concerned about potential fractures in his jawbone. Fantastic. So, as he started coming in more often, he directed all his frustrations at me. I was 22, my wife was in graduate school, and I needed this job. But the stress was getting to me. I was constantly thinking about work, dwelling on the last thing I'd been unfairly scolded over. I was waking up three or four times a night without knowing why, and my wife said I tossed and turned even when I managed to sleep. This went on for a week or two. Then one day, boss walked in with a new handheld digital voice recorder. He handed it to me and said, when I record a voice note, I want it saved in the format boss, date, note. Show me how to use it. This was actually within my expertise, so I took the recorder, grabbed the manual, and began to figure it out. I quickly came up with an easy how to guide. But then I noticed something in the manual. Voice recordings are saved in the device as voice recording, time, date, stamp. Once you import them to your personal computer, you can rename them as needed. So, boss's exact request wasn't possible with the device's software, but there was a simple workaround. I included this workaround in my guide and sat down with boss to go over it. Naturally, he got upset when he found out he couldn't rename the files directly on the device. He couldn't believe I hadn't figured this out. He was certain that I could make it happen. He demanded to know if I'd even read the manual and insisted that the device could do exactly what he wanted if I would only do my job. Then he ordered, You, go home right now, and don't come back until you've figured out how to do what I want. Cue my relieved yet subtle compliance. I went home, and since I knew that what boss wanted was impossible, I didn't consider returning. I didn't call in on my next scheduled day, and I didn't go to the office, I tried to put the entire ordeal out of my mind, and I began to sleep soundly again. Two weeks passed. I'd moved on, looking for another job, focusing on school, and living normally. Out of the blue, boss called me. Hey, you haven't been in for a while. Is everything okay? When are you coming back to work? I've got some technology issues I need your help with. I was stunned. This guy was talking to me as though the last time we'd spoken he hadn't been yelling at the top of his lungs. So I replied, Well, you told me not to come back until I'd figured out that voice recorder issue, so I didn't come back because the device will never do what you wanted. Boss replied, Oh, that? I took it back to the store. So, I'll see you tomorrow. I responded, Um, no. I figured I was fired, so I got another job. Please mail me my last check, and don't call me again. Thanks, goodbye. And I hung up, laughing. It had never felt so good to be out of work. Story 4 This happened a month ago, but the thought of it scares me. My grandmother died before I was born and left my grandfather lonely. He had three sons, bro one, bro two, bro three, who is my dad. My dad was the youngest of them. His sons helped him out, and he moved off of the family house and into a small mobile home. Ten years later, Bro Two had gone through a divorce and moved in with him. He suddenly died from liver issues. My grandfather was now severely depressed and lonely. My dad got an idea. He thought why not get him a pet to keep him company. He later found out that one of his neighbor's cats had kittens. Her cat had four kittens. She kept one kitten and gave the others to people who wanted them once they were at an appropriate age. After that, he asked her, and she said yes. It was confirmed that he will get a cat. In December of 2019, we brought him his furry baby. The cat and him are so cute as if the cat understands English when he is talking. We named him Charlie. During the summer of the pandemic, he was let outside little by little. We let him explore the small neighborhood. Characters, me, grandfather, entitled mother, entitled kid, police officer one and police officer two. Now to the story. That day, I asked my dad if we could see Gramps and Charlie. He said yes, and he dropped me off. He had to go to work. He was working on a Saturday because one of his co-workers was on vacation. We are getting a cat soon. My dad left and I went inside. 
Gramps and I let the cat outside, then sat on the porch, and we were having a conversation about what his life was like in the forties. The cat is laying down on the grass facing the street. We hear two people walking. They walked closer to the driveway. In comes the entitled mother and her entitled kid. Entitled kid, Kitty. He points to Charlie. The kid was like eight. Gramps, hi, you can pet the cat, but you need to put on a mask. My Gramps is high risk. Well, we don't have them. Can we still pet them? Hi, my Gramps is 83 and is high risk. So if you don't have a mask, then we need you to leave because a lot of people are high risk and you need permission to be here. Shut up. Don't talk to your elders like that. She was in her 30s. Baby, you can pet the cat. Gramps, ma'am, you need to leave now or I will call the police. Entitled mother, Babem, take the cat. It's your reward for having to deal with these jerks. What? Give Charlie back. Charlie manages to get out of the kid's arms, hisses at him, and runs inside. I walk to the entitled mother. You can't just steal other people's cats. Entitled kid, Mommy, I want the kitty. And the kid starts crying. The entitled mother kicked and pushed me to the cement. Give me the cat now or I will call the police. Gramps. Oh, you won't need to. I already called them and I have your picture. No need to run. Also, don't kick my grandson or I will mess you up. The kid runs to his mother and hides behind her. She stood there with a huge grin, and five minutes later the police came. Police officer one, now what's the issue? The entitled mother cuts him off and smugly says, These two trespassed on to my property and stole our cat. Police officer two, what's your side? He asks Gramps. Gramps, well I have a video if that helps. The entitled mother's grin turns into a red face. Me. Yeah, she also kicked and punched me. I show him the marks, and he looks back at the video. Police Officer 1. Ma'am, put your hands up. You are arrested for assaulting a minor, attempted robbery, and trespassing. The father of the kid comes to pick him up and glares at us. Police Officer 2. Do you want to press charges? Gramps replied with a yes. My dad comes and Charlie is now scared of the front yard. Story 5. My school had a tradition, and I'm not sure if it's odd or not, but each year we had kind of a mini valedictorian award, starting in middle school. I was in the gifted program, so several of us had 4.0s, so the award was given to whoever had the highest overall GPA on the 100-point scale. I have always been very competitive by nature, so I set my sights on winning this award in the seventh grade. However, there was a bit of competition, Let's call him Todd. Todd had really good grades as well, with a top spot usually bouncing back and forth between the two of us. It was so close that every single quiz, exam, and homework assignment had the potential to dethrone one of us while lifting the other. I had an average of 98. Something, as did he. Todd had a bit of an edge. However, see, Todd's mom was known for being a bully. She would yell, scream, berate, and openly mock any teacher who dared to give Todd a lower grade than me. But that isn't all. Todd's mom was also a teacher at our school. She would openly defy and berate her own colleagues, should they not provide whatever grade she wanted for Todd. Now, usually the school would avoid giving a child a class with their mother, but sometimes this was unavoidable. Naturally, we ended up in a class with his mother as the teacher. This was a world history class, one which required several papers, tests, etc. By the end of the year, Todd and I had been neck and neck in this class. But I noticed something. I consistently outperformed Todd by several points on any objective learning assessments, fill in the blank tests, multiple choice, etc. However, somehow Todd consistently outperformed me on written subjective learning assessments, papers, essays, etc. Being a young and ignorant kid, I just assumed he was better at writing. That is, until our final assignment rolled around. All our tests had been taken. All our quizzes and homework assignments graded. All our papers submitted and graded. The semester was functionally complete. I held a fraction of a point over Todd in the class, which put me overall ahead in the valedictorian race. 
but Mommy Dearest couldn't have that. So, with three days left of the year, she assigned a list-minute two-page paper. Short and simple, I submitted mine and received a 95. Fair enough. I found out that Todd got a 100, just enough to put him ahead of me in the class and in the valedictorian race. I was frustrated, so I asked Todd to see his paper repeatedly, desperate to find ways to improve to better my chances the next year. He refused, again and again. Then I remembered, when his mom handed the papers back to us, she never gave one to Todd. He hadn't done the paper, it was purely an assignment contrived to put him ahead. Now comes the revenge, our school had just transferred to a paperless gradebook system the year before, so this was the second year on it. The principal was determined to make this cost efficient, so after the first trial year, he didn't even bother restocking the teachers with physical grade books. That way, he could add the amount saved from physical books to the total amount that the new paperless system was saving the school. Now, during this time I also worked. I had a family member who owned a small local ISP, and I would help out at every opportunity. I loved computers, and still do. Now, working with this family member equipped me with much more networking knowledge than other kids my age, and even most adults. I decided that with this power come great responsibility, I was going to right this grievous injustice. So, I started digging. I got on a school PC and started going through the network. Turns out, the school had wanted to save as much money as possible while going paperless. So, they didn't hire a professional technician, consultant, or anything. One of the dads just volunteered in exchange for a reduced tuition charge private school. So, this system was just a nightmare. There was no dedicated network for sharing grades. There was no password protection on any files. There were no administrative restrictions on any files, nothing. What he did was just share a single directory on the headmaster's computer. That directory held the entire gradebook for each and every class of each and every grade, kindergarten through twelfth grade. I thought this was too good to be true. Surely there was a backup somewhere. So, I went to the school's port switcher, which was just in an unlocked closet. I checked around, expecting to see a server or a set of drives set to automatically back up whatever is shared on the network. Nada. Now, I was in a rage. I had gone to the principal several times, pointing out that Todd's mom was abusing her position. She was bullying teachers to give her kid an edge. Her son would even brag about how he could get away with not doing homework in other classes, because mommy would make sure nothing came of it. But the principal had failed to act. He had declared that each teacher was sovereign in their classrooms. So long as nothing illegal happened, he would not intervene. He was a very unprincipled principal. So, I made a decision to delete nepotism. I couldn't just change my grades in her class. She monitored my average like a hawk. So, I went nuclear. I went into that subdirectory and deleted every single file in it. But, the principal had shared his whole user's desktop directory. So, I emptied the recycling. I completely wiped every trace of grading software on that computer, because the idiot didn't even put a password on the computer. So, from the desktop subdirectory I was able to access. Everything. This was in the very last couple of days of school. There were no hard copies gradebooks. There were no backups. There was nothing remaining to even prove that the school year ever occurred. On the final day of school, we get called into an assembly. The principal is visibly disheveled, shaken, and upset. Not even angry, just broken. He announced that the entire year of grades were totally lost. The school didn't know what to do because there were no hard copies. They couldn't recover the data because they cheaped out and didn't purchase a backup system. All they could do was reinstall the software. But on grading software, if there is no grade to input, then what does it default to when showing the grades of the students? A 100%. Every single student in that school got valedictorian of their class that year. 100% all around. Heck, even a few kids got enough of a boost from that final year that they got to graduate on time instead of being held back. Next year, we had a new principal. I was held slightly suspect since everyone knew of my tech background, but nobody could prove anything. Even the PCs in the computer lab didn't have usernames or passwords so there was no way to link me to anything. 
That following year, security cameras and passwords were put in the computer lab. Story 6. My birthday falls on December 28th, but my parents have rarely acknowledged it. We often visit extended family during the holidays, which usually takes place on or around my birthday. Sometimes, if my birthday falls on a Friday or a Sunday, it isn't quite as overlooked, since we celebrate Christmas on the Saturday in between. Even then, though, my birthday goes uncelebrated, and I might get a casual happy birthday from one of them if I'm lucky. Over the years, I've hinted at how much this bothers me, but I've never addressed it directly until now. Still, I'm not sure exactly what to say. It feels like a pattern. Even at my wedding, they did something similar. After we announced our engagement, my sister immediately followed with her own announcement and decided to hold her wedding ceremony the same year. Shortly after ours, family from across the country flew in for her wedding, but not for mine. My sister, born in early January, pretends to understand, but it's not the same. She doesn't have to share her birthday with a holiday that takes over every room and every conversation. My birthday, on the other hand, is usually a toss-up as to whether anyone will even remember it. This is how it usually goes. We head up to visit family the first weekend after Christmas, staying in a large house with rooms for everyone. My whole family is there when the 28th rolls around. I wake up, and maybe one person remembers to say, Happy Birthday, but only if no one else is around. If others are there to overhear, they'll chime in with a half-hearted, Oh hey, Happy Birthday! Before shifting back to discussing Christmas dinner, when we're opening gifts, or how excited everyone is to watch the two youngest cousins open their mountain of presents. My birthday, yet again, gets lost in the holiday shuffle. I know I probably sound bitter and maybe a bit selfish. Typically, things like this wouldn't get to me. For most of my life, my birthday has been squished together with Christmas, which I could deal with. Many birthdays have passed without much celebration, and gifts have either been forgotten or given with a this is your Christmas and birthday present tagline. Despite all that, a simple happy birthday from my parents has always been enough to make me feel appreciated. But this year, it seems like my parents have gone out of their way to ignore my wishes. To add to it, Christmas falls on a Wednesday this year, making the 28th a Saturday. It's not often my birthday lands on a Saturday, but when it has in the past, it's been miserable because the family always picks Saturday for our delayed Christmas. So I asked my mom in advance to avoid scheduling the family gathering on my birthday. I told her we could celebrate New Year's if she wanted, just any day but the 28th. Even my wife joined in, reminding her that I hadn't had a proper birthday in years. My mom said she'd try to work it out. A few days later, my mom called to tell me that my sister could only get her stepson on the weekend after Christmas. She suggested we'd probably break things up, and they'd head up on the 28th with my sister, while we'd join on the following weekend. That was fine by me. At least this way, I could spend Christmas with my parents, have a low-key birthday with my wife, and still see my extended family the weekend after. Or so I thought. Today, I stopped by my parents' house, and my mom brought up the holiday plans again. She told me, since we're splitting the celebrations, we'll probably just go up once with your sister on the 28th instead of doing both weekends. I felt disappointed, realizing she'd chosen to ignore my one request and planned Christmas with a family on my birthday anyway. She went on to explain that all my uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, and nephews would be there that day the whole family, essentially, except my wife and me. Memories of my wedding flooded back, and I couldn't help but feel hurt. The one thing I asked for, just one day for my birthday, was disregarded. I know I might come across as bratty or self-centered, but you have to understand, this has been my experience for my entire life, and I've rarely spoken up. This isn't just about my birthday, either. One year, I told her my wife can't handle dairy well and she still made every dish with dairy and then criticized me for being ungrateful. Another time, I asked for a button-up coat without a zipper for Christmas, and she went out of her way to buy me one with a zipper. My wife describes it perfectly. Your mom knows exactly what she's doing when she disregards your requests. 
She does it subtly enough to make you feel bad for bringing it up, but obvious enough that you know she doesn't respect your wishes. So now, for the fifth year in a row, my birthday will go ignored and overshadowed by Christmas. Only this time, I won't be with my family, as I've finally decided not to let them rope me into another come up for your birthday. It'll be fun scenario. Thankfully, I'll be with my wife. We may not have much only about $50 to our name right now, but she's promised to make my 34th birthday special. Knowing that my last few have been forgotten, I trust her. As long as she says, happy birthday, and I know she will, and I get to wake up next to her, it might just be the best birthday I've had in years. I love that woman. And for anyone who thinks 34 is too old to care about birthdays, please, think again. Your birthday matters, no matter your age. To those with holiday season birthdays, know you're not alone. While I can't fully relate to those born on Christmas, I know what it's like to have your birthday lost in the holiday chaos. Take a moment for yourself on that day. You deserve it.